new cities like Songdo are designed like laboratories of the future. They are pilot cities where specialists in new technologies get to try out their latest innovations in terms of so-called smart cities on a life-size blank canvas. Cities that use IT and communication technologies to optimize urban networks and resources. Today, at the rate at which we're consuming energy, within the next, uh, by 2040 or 2050, you need the, you need five Earths to support this one Earth of population. And that's just not gonna happen. I tell that the future great cities and smart cities will not look any different than the cities that they look now, but it'll be managed differently. It'll be run differently. People will live there differently. They'll be more globally connected. When we talk about smart cities and when we talk about technology, it is to address issues like how do I increase the utilization of resources. For example, in a building like this, there are 75 to 85 protocols, but they don't talk to each other. HVAC system doesn't talk to your lighting. Lighting doesn't talk to the fire. Fire doesn't talk to the networks. If you integrate that, you can lower the cost of energy by 30 to 40%. And in a city, if you can lower your cost of energy by 30 to 40%, that's a huge impact on the city budget. Along with Cisco and other tech companies, the South Koreans made Songdo the first U city in the world, a ubiquitous city where everything is connected. Millions of sensors are installed in all the infrastructures and in all the buildings. These are linked to a central computer, which manages most of the services in the city to make it the most efficient possible. All the data are collected, and most are treated automatically in a control center straight out of a science fiction film. You could call this the brain of the U-City, the central nervous system where everything is connected. The U-City concept brings together a lot of data about the city, including videos, sensor data, weather information, traffic info, criminal prevention information, breaking and entering. All this information is interlinked, so it's a very complex structure. The city can respond much better to what happens in real time. If you had to win a Formula One race 10, 15 years ago, you needed a good driver and a good car. The physical infrastructure was vital. But today, if you want to be in a Formula One race, actually, you also need a system of telemetry. Thousands and thousands of sensors onto the car, collecting information in real time, sending it wirelessly to computers where information is analyzed, is processed, and decisions are made in real time. The real-time control system becomes vital for winning the race. And if you want, what is happening today at the city scale is the same. It's actually sensing and actuating in our cities, become a little bit like that Formula One racing car. Today's cities are caught up in a race against the clock to deal with the depletion of fossil fuels and rising greenhouse gas emissions, which are responsible for climate change. New cities attempt to rise to this challenge as best they can by constructing control centers that allow them to save their resources and by developing more and more green energy. In China, Tianjin Eco City has an objective to use 20% renewable energies by 2020. We installed the five wind turbines behind me in Tianjin Eco City at the end of 2011 as part of a project to harness wind power for electricity. The total production capacity of the project is 4.5 megawatts. The total electricity production must cover the annual electricity consumption of 2,000 households in the city. Because Tianjin isn't very exposed to the wind, among the renewable energy sources used here, the proportion of geothermic and solar energy is higher. The big problem with renewable energies like solar or wind power is that they are intermittent energies. The sun doesn't always shine, and the wind doesn't always blow. And today, there's no miracle technique to capture and store enough renewable energy to completely replace fossil fuels. That's why Tianjin Eco City, like Songdo, gets most of its electricity from a power station. But it is more environmentally friendly than a traditional power station because it uses LNG, or liquefied natural gas, which emits much less CO2 than conventional gas and other fossil fuels. 
Right from the design of the power station, we decided to only produce electricity using LNG. You could say that there is virtually nothing in that gas that is toxic for the environment. And for the combustion of the gas, we also opted to use low NOx burners that have low nitrogen oxide emissions. The vapor produced by the gas turbines when generating electricity isn't wasted into the air. The heat is used to reheat water used in the city network. The technologies used in the city allow it to reduce its energy footprint, and they are not limited to public infrastructure. They are also used in housing blocks and apartments, which are all equipped with smart meters. Here we can see our gas consumption, the security, the heating, water, electricity. We can see all of that. In red is what our household is using, and in green is the average use of the other households in the building. In November, the others only use that. But we use too much. And because we use too much, we feel we have to reduce it. Thanks to these functions, I've been able to make savings in terms of electricity, water and heating. Compared to my previous apartment, I can save between 30 to 40 percent. There is even a competition for ideas on how to reduce consumption. And the one who uses the least gets a prize from the property management company. The prize is a month's free entrance to the fitness center in the basement. There's even this. <laughs> Hmm. Thanks to these smart meters, the residents can reduce their consumption. The city agents, in turn, can optimize use of the resources. They can know in real time how much energy each building is using, and thus adapt production to meet consumption and redirect energy between the buildings. This smart resource management is also applied to the city's water network. It's important to react quickly if there's a water leak. So each pipe is fitted with a sensor that monitors the pressure of the flow. When the flow is very low, that indicates a risk of leakage. So we send a message to the Directorate of Technical Services or to the appropriate body so they can check it out as quickly as possible. One third of the water resources of global cities, by the way, is wasted through pipes. So we're, we're trying to um, think um, uh, more cleverly about how to protect our water assets through conservation of use, but also through, uh, through um, our piping methodologies. And um, you'll have the desalination plants that will desalinate for fresh water. In Saudi, we have to think about sustainability in water because we have so little of it. While the planet's drinking water supplies are shrinking radically with the unbridled development of human activity, the developers of new cities are doing all they can to limit the use of this precious resource as much as possible. Annual rainfall in South Korea is 1,500 millimeters. The rainfall is concentrated in the summer months, from July to September. So this is a water-stressed country. This canal is 1.8 kilometers long and around 1.5 meters deep. This is desalinated seawater. And we have a system that recycles part of our wastewater, 40 percent which is recycled. We supply around 3,000 tons of water per day. That means we save around 3,000 tons of water. The water we recycle is used for flushing lavatories, cleaning streets, or for landscaping and parks, for example. There are a lot of parks, and we also supply the water for the lake. There are 22.3 kilometers of pipes in total, measuring 250 or 400 millimeters in diameter. And that forms a kind of spider web. It's hard to create this kind of system in existing cities because of the pipes already in place.
In the south of China, near Changsha, the Lake Yang EcoCity has built a pilot station for wastewater recycling that is even more innovative than the one in Songdo. It uses aquatic plants to eliminate the micropollutants that can be found in water recycled by traditional treatment plants. These are artificial humid zones from the wastewater recycling plant at Lake Yang City. The total surface area is 8 hectares, and we have planted 20 different kinds of aquatic plant. These plants are our wastewater recycling machines. As they grow, the plants absorb particles of nitrogen and phosphorus. When the water flows through this gravel, it filters, settles, absorbs, and exchanges the ions, etc. These are chemical physical principles. We chose this method because it is very important for an ecological town. The artificial humid zones allow us to save a great deal of energy. The system uses no electricity at all. The water is very clear. It's the highest norm for recycled water in China. This is the water that arrives in the wastewater plant of Lake Yang City. This is the intermediary stage, water treated by the industrial method, and this is the final stage, once the water is treated by the artificial humid zones. After two or three years behind us, we think that with the process of urbanization of the country, many more new places should be able to use our concept.